It's Taj of me. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher here in the Los Angeles area. This is year 18 in the classroom for me. And this, of course, is all the above, your home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our world of education. We want to extend a very well warm welcome to anybody who might be joining us for the very first time. We have a super dope guest who's actually been on the show before many years ago. And um, we think we might have some new viewers or some new listeners based on who this dope guest is. In fact, all of our guests are dope. So if you're new to our show, please scroll down through the feed. Through all of our previous episodes, we've we've had so many great conversations centering our, our most marginalized students and really talking about how we could form a more humanizing school system for all. So definitely scroll through if you are new to the show. AOTAshow.com has all the all the previous episodes. But um, Jeff, here we are. Fresh, brand new episode, and it is the end of spooky season. Jeff, this is, a, I believe this is Halloween weekend, man. Are you any, are you a, a Halloween type person? We already know you love <laughs> pumpkin spice, but you know, here we yeah. are, Halloween time now. Listen, let the record reflect. I appreciate pumpkin spice, but Trader Joe's, uh, you have um, earned a little bit of reprieve from me because last week when I went, they had a new sign to distinguish between the pumpkin spice <laughs> and the mango yogurt. And I appreciate that, Justice Trader Justice for Joe's. Jeffrey, man. They listened, this, man. That's right. They listened to the people, apparently. So, wow. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, Manuel, Halloween, um, I appreciate more from a distance because those who, uh, you know, watch the show might not realize that I'm kind of a gigantic human being. And I basically... <laughs> I've basically been this size since ninth grade, okay? So I was like 6'3", um, like 250 pounds in ninth grade, okay? And, um, and so I was the kid who in like seventh grade, you know, when I would go trick-or-treating or sixth grade, they would kind of look at me suspect because I was like six feet tall. And they'd be like, aren't you a little big to be out here with the, you know, with wow. the kids, young man? And um, so I, and I couldn't buy costumes, right? Like none of the cool costumes that you get would ever fit me. So I, I kind of got turned off to Halloween younger than most people, which, which I think kind of, you know, ended my love affair with Halloween um, younger than it probably should have. So I appreciate Halloween, even though it's, it's somewhat difficult for me to participate. Ah, uh, I get you, I get you. That's, that's understandable, that's understandable. I, I always loved Halloween and I thought, you know, when I, when I grow up, mine's gonna be the household that has all the best candy to give out and all that stuff. Those are like aspirations of mine, but I don't get too many <laughs> trick-or-treaters around here. Like the trick-or-treating thing, I don't know what it's like in the rest of the nation, but it's, it's few and far between out here. So it's kind of like, eh, whatever. But I'm looking forward to the Thanksgiving break. But that's for that's a conversation for another day. I, I definitely need some time off. But here we are, Jeff. We have a, a fully packed agenda. What do we have today? Well, man, well, we got a good one for everybody today, as usual. And this, I think, as you alluded to at the beginning, is actually kind of a momentous day in all the above history because we are having back on after four years one of our very first guests from way back in 2017, our very first season of the show, episode number two, we had on this fantastic educator, Roxana Duenas, who is a history and ethnic studies teacher in the Boyle Heights section uh, of Los Angeles. Um, and she is coming back on with us today to talk more about the issues related to ethnic studies. So she has served on the district ethnic studies leadership team. For those who don't know, ethnic studies is becoming a graduation requirement in Los Angeles. It is now also becoming a graduation requirement in the state. Uh, and this, of course, is in the midst of all the CRT hysteria um, in the world. You also may recognize Roxana. A lot has happened in her life since uh, we had her on the show last because she was literally the face of the Los Angeles teacher strike uh, back in 2019. So you've all seen the poster, the cool, you know, artful poster um, done by a local artist here. That was literally her. So um, it's gonna be a fascinating conversation. We're gonna dig deep into some great uh, discussion about ethnic studies and the kind of political climate around it. So you definitely don't wanna miss it. 
Yeah, sounds dope. Can't wait. And if some of y'all are listening and you're like, what poster? What poster? Um, well, you should hop over to the YouTubes because you will put the link to this video episode under under the audio podcast and you'll see the poster right there. Really, really dope poster. And can't wait to have discussions with her today about ethnic studies. Here we are four years after Four years since she first came on the show. Jeff, we've been on, we've been doing this for a minute. We've been doing this for a minute and I love it. I love it. Um, but folks, up first is our Do Now segment where we take a look at recent news and headlines in the world of education. Stay tuned. All right, folks, now it's time for today's Do Now. Let's take a look at some news and headlines in the world of education. Jeff, how are we going to do the Do Now today? Well, Manuel, today uh, we're going to get into some key vocabulary terms. It's, it is my favorite way that we do our Do Now segments, I have to say, um, which is a lexicon. All right, lexicon. Let's get that vocab up. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Um, what is it like? Accelerated learning, right, Jeff? Because of all the learning loss, we've got to learn faster. So let's build up that vocabulary, get our reading levels up. You know what I'm saying? Let's, mm -hmm. let's do it. Yes. Yes. Double blocks of English and math for all, all. that. Yes. <laughs> so here we are. First word, first lexicon term for today is a uh, diphtheria. Wow. Okay. Uh, diphtheria, one of my favorite communicable diseases. <laughs> uh, you know, of all the diseases, who doesn't love diphtheria? Um, you know what's funny about diphtheria, Manuel? Is what's it funny is a, about diphtheria? <laughs> Probably nothing, actually. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, the projectile diarrhea and fever and other things that you get with diphtheria uh, isn't funny at all. Um, but you know what? I don't know a single person who's ever had diphtheria, Manuel. Like, literally no one in my life, okay, my four plus decades on this planet. I don't know nobody who's had diphtheria. Do you? Well, Jeff... I happen to not know anybody, which is good okay. because, you know, this yes. thing, this, uh, <laughs> this uh, infection is, is really bad and it really like, like swells up your throat and makes it hard to breathe. And in the 1600s, there was a diphtheria outbreak in Spain and they, they called it, I think, 1613 or something like that. It was the, uh, the year of strangulations. So, yeah, it's good that we don't know too many people that have it. And I believe that might be because all 50 states and the District of Columbia require a vaccine for diphtheria before children are allowed to show up in schools. So um, yeah, we pretty much wiped that out through uh, vaccine mandates, which is kind of you, odd, Jeff. You mean it wasn't through um, prayer and uh, people doing CrossFit? Is that? <laughs> it it was not that? through that. We did have to give up our okay. freedom, Jeff. We did have to sacrifice our freedom um, in order to, um, you know, get rid of this thing. But you know, this leads us to the one of the big stories of the last several months, which is uh, vaccine mandates. And we're gonna take a look at, in particular at vaccine mandates in school systems. And this comes to us thanks to the Pew Research Center um, through some, some writing done by Drew DeSilver, who kind of uh, took a look at the history of vaccines and vaccine mandates as it pertains to school children. All right, so he wrote that uh, as more and more regions, of course, are considering requiring COVID-19 vaccines for students to attend in-person instruction, um, the, the battle over these vaccine mandates seems to be heating up more and more. In fact, in uh, some separate reporting from the from the Fresno Bee, we, we uh, came across uh, news of a student who in Central California went to a school board meeting to ask the school board members to stand up for vaccine mandates and masking. And this student was shouted down by the adults in the room. Uh, one adult said, boy, sit. And another adult said, just because one person is allergic to water, should we all stop drinking water? And uh, this student left the room in tears after these adults shouted them down for advocating for a vaccine. So in any case, back to the Pew Research uh, article, um, he points out that both Democrat and Republican-led states already require hundreds of thousands of their citizens, infants, toddlers, and school children mostly, to be vaccinated against a whole host of diseases. In fact, mandatory childhood immunizations have been a feature of American society for over a hundred years. Vaccination mandates in the U.S. date back to the 19th century when many cities and states started requiring children to be immunized against smallpox. The Supreme Court upheld such mandates in a landmark 1905 decision. And in fact, of the 16 immunizations that the CDC recommends for children and teens, all 50 states and the District of Columbia mandate 
the diphtheria vaccine, tetanus, whooping cough, polio, measles, rubella, and chickenpox vaccinations. In addition, every state except Iowa mandates immunizations against the mumps. Except for chickenpox, which became available, uh, th that vaccine became available in the United States in 1995. All those other vaccines have been around for 50 years or more. So we're talking about long-standing practice here. Among newer childhood va vaccinations, however, state mandates are a little bit more of a mixed bag. All but two states require vaccination against hepatitis B at some point in the child's life, but about half the states don't require a vaccination for hepatitis A. And just six states, five of them in in the Northeast require annual flu vaccines for childcare or preschool enrollment. So Jeffrey, man, vaccine mandates, stripping us of our freedom. What, what, <laughs> what did happen? What happened to freedom, Jeff? So let's talk about this. What, do, what are your thoughts here? Uh, here we have some, uh, a more, some historical context behind uh, vaccines for school children. And uh, I don't know, do you think this historical context may perhaps change some minds and, and ease some of these folks who are up in arms about these vaccines? Yeah, uh, I, <laughs> maybe, maybe, probably not for the true fringe folks out there. I'm sure they're not watching all the above. Um, but what, what I think is um, interesting to note at the just at the very outset here, Manuel, is um, I didn't even know what the symptoms of, of diphtheria are. I was just making up stuff about projectile <laughs> diarrhea. Sorry, sorry for that imagery. Uh, I was wondering, I was like, I didn't know it caused those other things too. I thought it was no, just, no, it I, choked I, you out. <laughs> Here's how effective the vaccine is, man. Well, I don't even know what it does to you, okay? <laughs> like, we had to Google that, all right? So, um, you know, yes, what's fascinating to me about this story is that for a century now or more, we have lived in a world where the vaccines are a technology available to us, okay? All throughout that time, there's been various iterations of skepticism, religious objection, other sort, you know, sorts of things, conspiracy theories, whatnot, right? Um, and at the same time, we all live in a world, Manuel, where almost every adult that you see walking around in the United States of America has experienced multiple rounds of vaccination and multiple rounds of compulsory vaccination. OK, so probably the most um, common school embedded versions of this that people know about are like you've, lots of folks have heard about the, the Tdap, right? Uh, which is the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis uh, vaccination, okay? That kids, anyone who's worked in middle school especially um, is aware of that because you know at the start of the school year in lots of, you know, almost every state across the country with your incoming sixth graders, they, kids have to bring in proof of vaccination because that's the time, like around 11 years old, uh, I believe it is, where you get your Tdap booster shot, okay? <laughs> and we literally have to like go get the kids or hold them at the door and can't let them attend school until they bring in proof of vaccination, okay? Um, so this, like, this, this is happening all over the country all the time. Um, and nobody's like up in arms about this because for whatever reason, we can agree the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis wouldn't be a good look <laughs> for us to have spreading uh, around our schools and therefore our communities. Um, so what's fascinating about this to me, Memo, oh, I, I, one second, I mentioned um, there's two uh, rounds of vaccination. The other is the, the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella, right? And again, not a single one of us knows anybody who's had measles, mumps, or rubella, right? Or like literally almost no one um, who's had these except for certain, you know, frankly, religious communities where they refuse to, um, you know, to be vaccinated and things like measles does spread, right? So fast forward to today, Manuel. And to me, what's really fascinating about this is the kind of schism in our consciousness that's just present today with more recent uh, developments of vaccinations, including um, COVID-19, of course, but also um, including HPV, which was uh, which is the human papillomavirus. That's a vaccination that was just developed, say, in the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. But um, different states took different approaches to mandating um, that vaccination. And for whatever reason, family pushback has been much stronger against that vaccine than any of the many, many other vaccines that 
everybody walking around has had, right? Um, and so it's just an interesting like psychological phenomenon um, that I think we experience where we're totally consenting and comfortable with some vaccines and then totally suspicious uh, and, you know, and, and resistant to others. Um, and I was talking recently with a, a good friend of mine who's an educator who has, you know, school age kids, um, one of whom is is now old enough, right, is 12 or older and in the vaccine eligible age group and was talking to this person and they were saying like, look, I got vaccinated for COVID, um, but it just feels weird to me that this, you know, it would be mandated that I have to vaccinate my child. And I was like, what about all the other vaccines that you gave your kid that you had to give your kid because they're mandated? And he was basically like, I know, I hear what you're saying rationally, but it just feels weird and wrong for some reason on this one. And I think that's kind of where we are. Like, I think he's probably representative of lots of people that for whatever reason, whether it's the newness of the vaccine, whether it's the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine, whether it's the um, sort of degrading of remnants of trust that people may have had in, in like public officials, that frankly, the, you know, the Trump administration did us no favors around, um, you know, and the politicizing of the, you know, the CDC and the, and the FDA and the kind of regulatory mechanism around vaccines. For whatever reason, we live in this world where, you know, where we are lots and lots of people are holding these two, com you know, competing ideas at the same time, like complete trust and willingness to participate in one set and total distrust or large distrust in another um, from some people. Right. And um, I think that's what's going on in a lot of places. And I, I don't see necessarily um, a lot of effort from public health officials or from maybe even from school systems where we're considering these, you know, like mandates for COVID-19 vaccines to address people like that who aren't the fringe nut jobs that you, you know, that Jordan Kepler goes and talks to on, you know, on the, the Daily Show, right? Um, but who are just people who are like, I don't know, something about this feels wrong and I can't explain why, right? Um, so I think this article gives some really useful information. I don't know if it's gonna sway anyone, but uh, to me, that was kind of my takeaway of like where we are, Manuel. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think about this and just thinking about where we are right now in this conversation about vaccines. And it's one of those things where I'm like, aside from, aside from billionaires and Zoom, who had a bigger come up during this pandemic? Who had a bigger growth and rise than anti-vaxxers? Because I swear, before this pandemic, Yes, there were anti-vaxxers. They were often looked at as like very fringe and just look how look how much they've grown during this time. Look how many more people are now in that anti-vaxxer camp. Look how we have gotten to like mainstream discourse around vaccines and vaccine mandates. And it is, it's pure anti-vaxxer. And that that's a big come up. So, you know, wherever, wherever you fall, wherever, you know, folks lie on this, on this conversation about vaccines and vaccine mandates, just like, it's one of those things where, wow, that, that camp really grew during this pandemic. So they are up there with Zoom and, and billionaires and um, who else really grew? I don't know. Uh, the pandemic was, did, did well, did numbers for some folks. Now, when it comes to these uh, vaccine mandates, one thing that's very disappointing for me is that total lack of, or apparent lack of sort of bigger picture thinking in historical context. So uh, as you pointed out, the person you had a conversation with and just how like, for some reason, the COVID-19 vaccine that just sits differently with folks than all these other shots that we've been getting for decades, for decades. And it's reached a point where even talking about it, I think it, it's spoken about so negatively in, in so many ways, or at least the, the criticisms of it get amplified so much that I think it does for, for a lot of just folks who are, you know, more or less in the middle, not really so much super anti-vaccine or super pro-vaccine, 
for a lot of folks, I think just hearing those terms like mandates or vaccine mandates um, just brings up some like discomfort because, uh, they, you know, it's just associated with such a, a, a vicious debate right now. And when you think about like childhood shots, like that still seems like such an innocent thing. Like, oh, yeah, I got shots when I was a kid. I got my shots when I was a kid. And that still seems like sort of like an innocent type of vibe, whereas the a vaccine mandate is like this like intense political debate when really they're, you know, they're the same thing. It's the terminology and the lexicon around it that, that are a bit different. So it's very, very disappointing. I, I, you know, I, I definitely understand folks who are still somewhat um, nervous or cautious around it, around the idea of a mandate, but it's just really, really disappointing that we can't have honest conversations about it. We can't talk about it honestly because it's so embroiled in, in I don't know, in politics and in, in, you know, even though most folks probably aren't on the extreme fringes of like, you know, deep anti-vaxxer territory, still like there's enough folks who are kind of like just unsure. And a lot of that super extreme stuff gets gets promoted through the algorithms and gets promoted through us just responding to it and reacting to it, that it becomes, you know, normalized, like kind of center part of the conversation. You see footage of, of police officers and firefighters like turning in their boots or whatever happened up there in Washington, rather than get their shots, even though they had to get a whole host of other shots in order to, uh, to serve in that position in the first place. Um, I see a few teachers here and there, not many that I've seen, but a few here and there leave their leave their jobs rather than get the, the vaccine. And I'm just like, wow, it's really come to that. Like that is like, how did we get here? And what does this mean for every future vaccination that we might have to get as the world continues to change and as like more and more threats to our basic public health um, come about because of climate change and all the extremes that we're experiencing throughout the globe? What is this? What is, you know, how does this affect those, those future needs? As a classroom teacher, as a classroom teacher, I would very much prefer for my students to be vaccinated. I am super vaccinated and I'm looking forward to getting my booster shot. I understand parents who might be cautious and not want their students to, to get a vaccine shot. I don't know what percentage of my students have it. When the school year started, I thought most, if not, well, I thought the overwhelming majority of my students were vaccinated based on discussions I had with them last spring. Um, our school, our our school leadership is is signal that maybe it's it's not quite that. That actually there there might be a whole lot of students uh, who are not vaccinated, and you know we'll see we'll see what the future holds in that case. But I just wish we could have honest conversations. Like I'm not here saying that everybody, like every school district across the country needs to have a vaccination mandate for any kid that wants to attend in person. I I don't know necessarily that I am the one to like say that that's the best route. To me, it feels like the best route, but I wish we could at least just have a conversation about it without folks shouting down students who are speaking at the, the board about it. I wish we could just have a conversation about it without folks trying to equate it to segregation and discrimination. I was very disappointed that the the CEO of um, In-N-Out Burger, like I love In-N-Out, and the CEO came out talking about like, you know, it's basically like they're being asked to segregate and discriminate between which of their customers have a vaccine and which don't. I'm like, stop using those terms, man. You're conflating this with, with something that's, that's a whole another level of our nation's history. So I just wish we could have a regular conversation about it, but we can't. So shout out to the Pew Research Center for laying out the basic historical context of all these shots we've had when, you know, anybody who's like in military service and they're facing their deadline for their vaccination and they're uh, crying about their freedom and this and that. And it's just like, well, you had to get all these other shots to be in the military in the first place. Like as all these other things come up, all these like wild claims that just don't really sit well, I appreciate honest historical context like we saw in this in this article here, which we'll link underneath underneath this podcast, underneath this video. Um, I appreciate that because it's, it's kind of like a back to just some, some sensible conversation. Like here's where we are with this vaccine and that vaccine and this and that. And I just wish we could have a regular conversation about it, but we can't. As a classroom teacher, man, I just want the best for everybody. I just want us to get through the school year healthily and to be able to thrive right now, we're nowhere near thriving at all. If a vaccine mandate helps us get to a place where we could like be more present and be more calm and fewer, um, fewer quarantines and all that stuff, hey, I'm for it. But just let's at least be able to talk about it. But it's hard these days to talk about anything, Jeff, in a, in a nice, sensible, honest way. So that's that. It is. It is indeed. Um, hopefully, you know, we got the, the mandate coming here, uh, student vaccination mandate coming here in, um, you know, in Los Angeles real soon, right? Over the next couple of months. So it's going to, it's going to, it's going to be something. We'll see. <laughs> it's going to be something. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Indeed. All right, Jeff, next word for today. What's the next term for our lexicon? 
All right, man. Well, next term for today's lexicon is uh, smart, wicked smart kids. Ah, yeah. wicked smart. Um, that was us, Jeff. Right? We were at we were at Harvard, <laughs> at least you know our grad program, and and you know us 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 Harvard School of Education kids. We were the smart kids, right? So and so is this story about us, Jeff? Are we? You know, let's talk about us, this, man. It's, it's the internet story. era. We're supposed to be talking about ourselves, man. <laughs> This story about the smart kids who went to Harvard and played in the yard and <laughs> broke their arm. Uh, that, that's all the eyes I know how to do. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Boston. I, I appreciate you. And, and really, New England. Uh, there are many other New Englanders with that accent. That is um, true. Yes. Yeah, so this story has nothing to do with, <laughs> with us in that regard, at least. Uh, although I do feel a certain personal affinity for this story and feel very morally conflicted about this story, Manuel. So, um, so let's get into it here. Uh, this story comes to us by Jill Barche at the Heckinger Report. So shout, shout out to Jill. Um, and let's get into it. Gifted education has been in the headlines recently with, uh, of course, New York City's decision to overhaul its longtime practice of testing four-year-olds to determine gifted status, citing concerns of equity and racial discrimination. Regardless of the number of students in gifted programs, the racial and ethnic composition of the students in those programs is often askew, and this is true nationally. The racial breakdown of gifted enrollment consists of the following, according to the most recent data from the National Center for Educational Statistics. More than 13% of all Asian students are enrolled in gifted programs. About 4% of black students are. About 8% of white students and about 5% of Hispanic students. Now that mirrors, that disparity mirrors longstanding achievement differences on standardized tests. But researchers have also found that gifted black students are often overlooked, especially when they have white teachers. Efforts have been underway to do things like testing all children for gifted status as a means of closing opportunity gaps instead of waiting for parents to opt their children into testing. One popular idea is also to essentially cream the top from each school across a state or across a district, creating a threshold for giftedness that varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. While that qualifies many more students of color from low-income schools, they would still be underrepresented in gifted classrooms, researchers have calculated. A second equally important line of research is focusing on whether gifted and talented programs are worthwhile for the students who are in them at all. Several studies have found that students aren't learning any more when they receive gifted services. Most recently, a 2021 study published in the Journal of Educational Evaluation and Policy Analysis found that gifted programs across the nation provided little to no academic boost relative to their general ed peers. Now, some argue for the elimination of gifted and talented education altogether, but other researchers, including David Card from UC Berkeley and Laura Giuliano from UC Santa Cruz, have found that bright students of color especially benefit from being surrounded by other high-achieving peers. University of Wisconsin-Whitewater professor Scott Peters, who studies gifted ed, also argues for preserving gifted education programs. Quote, schools love to say that they will just challenge all kids in the regular education classroom. The problem is this tends to include five to seven grade levels of readiness. The result is teachers have to make hard choices on who gets to learn, and there is self-report data that the kids who are already at grade level don't get attention. End quote. So, Manuel, uh, this story is fascinating to me because I went to, uh, for, from first grade through eighth grade, a gifted and talented magnet program. Um, as a kid. So it's personally fascinating to me. I'm very curious to get your take on this as a teacher. Um, what do you think we should be doing about gifted programs in a world where clearly there are racial disparities and enrollment in them? Um, and at least there's questions about whether we should have them at all or how we should qualify students for them. What, what say you on this issue? Yeah, this is one of those topics, Jeff, where I think a lot of folks have uh, like kind of personalized it in one way or another. So in general, when it comes to education conversations, it, it's one of those things where well, everybody 
had some kind of schooling experience, right? So everybody has some kind of opinion about what worked for them and what didn't work for them and then how that applies to these broader conversations. And for myself, I also was, you know, labeled as gifted and talented or identified, I guess, as gifted and talented. And I think of it through my personal lens of like, yeah, I was gay and it meant zero for me. Like I wasn't at a separate school like you were. I was still in my traditional school. And yeah, I got to feel like the pride of like, ah, I'm gifted, I'm gifted, whatever. But it, it really didn't mean anything to me. So like when you're, um, what you just discussed just now, I'm thinking about the the study that showed that Gates students don't necessarily benefit academically from it. And I, I think about, I think about the sort of value, I guess the values that are embedded in this conversation that we often tiptoe around and we tiptoe around it because it's like really dangerous territory to to sort of like plant your uh, beliefs or your arguments on. But like, let's let's talk about it. The the study you mentioned at the end, the guy said, you know, people love to say that, like, we'll offer the rigorous education to to everybody, to all students. And it doesn't really happen because you have a classroom with six or seven different uh, grade levels in there. And it is students who are gifted get left behind, not left behind, but, but get ignored. It not that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that an argument for, like, extreme academic tracking? If you're saying that teachers can't handle having multiple levels in the classroom and the solution is to have the gifted students in a separate program, doesn't that mean we are then talking about splitting students up as early as we can identify them into different academic tracks? And if that's also the case, and you add the racial disparities that we see, isn't it also the case that we are, when I say we, I just mean a general we, we are saying that certain racial groups are more advanced than others, that that must be either your explanation for that either must be biological, which no one's going to step out here and say, or cultural, which no one's going to step out here and say. So we kind of just like, you know, report the facts, re report those stats, but I don't hear too many people kind of like digging deeper into what that means for them. So I say that all to say, Jeff, that like for those who are very passionate about gifted and talented education, here we are two co-hosts of the show. We are both identified for gifted and talented education. For those who are very passionate about it, aside from their personal experience in being in gifted and talented or their children being advanced students, because a lot of times I hear testimony from folks whose children are advanced and they fear that like, you know, when, well, when the student, when my student was in a regular class with regular kids, they didn't get enough, they were bored, this and that, whatever. We personalize it in those kind of ways, but what are we really saying in terms of our values and our beliefs about education and what it means and how it turns out? Are we really okay with the world where we track students academically and separate them out and give them different kinds of educational experiences based on our belief about what these tests show about their academic ability? Are we okay with a world where we continue to have certain racial groups be overrepresented in these gifted and talented uh, programs and others not? And we continue to allow that without going so far as to say that we believe that's like correct. That's a reflection of these groups. I don't know. It's just a real messy, messy, messy conversation. And I want to shout out those in New York who have been advocating for uh, restructuring or removal of these gifted and talented mechanisms out there because of the racial disparities, because of the fact that especially when it comes to black and brown kids, they are under identified, especially by their white teachers. I want to shout out Jose Wilson and all those educators out there in New York who are fighting the good fight on that front as a once student of color, now educator of color, a gifted and talented identified person, I want to say that, yes, I get it. Uh, it, it, it makes sense that like you would want more and more uh, black and brown gifted quote unquote students to have those experiences, but not nah, miss me with all of that. I believe that every, every child, regardless of their racial background, every child, regardless of their, their uh, income around them, should get the highest quality education possible. And yes, it's difficult if you have a classroom where you have students of multiple grade levels and reading levels, but it's not, for one, it's not impossible. Secondly, let's talk about how we can make that, um, help those teachers out and help those systems out to be able to enrich, have a, 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 a enrichment for all students at all levels without having to separate them out. If you're separating kids out as early as like elementary school, man, like what signal, what message are you sending to all the other kids who don't get separated out into the gifted area? And why couldn't you find a solution that didn't require separating kids out? I don't know. It's just, 
I, I don't know so if any I, of that made I'm, sense, I'm, Jeff, but I, I, I really, no, really, it's, it's always, it's always annoyed me how people talk about gifted and talented and, and bring their kids into it. Like, oh, my kid was bored in this class and this and that. I, I get it. I was a gifted kid too. Like, I get it. But we're talking about like an entire nation here and communities and populations across all different regions and kids that deserve the best, the best education possible. And we could do that without having to separate them out and give different experiences. At least I believe that we could do that. So I'm so glad you framed it this way, Manuel, because I find this whole issue to be fascinating and I find the way that we talk about it to be actually largely unhelpful. Because on the one hand, you said, ain't nobody out here talking about, you know, the differences we see in gifted programs is biological. There's some people out here talking about that and they're just racist, white supremacist True. people, right? Um, and like a small sliver of Asian folks who are like Asian supremacist people, I guess, uh, who are looking down on the, on the white folks, talk about the white folks who are taking, you know, affirmative action to get their seats. So... Um, yeah, those folks, you know, miss me with them. I'm not here, you know, for their pseudoscience nonsense. We left that in the 19th century and they can go back there if they want, okay? However, there is a important and rational and reasonable and not racist conversation to be had about this issue, Manuel, because um, I think there's just some fundamentally like obvious aspects about human life and that, that, don't align with, I think, sometimes what we want to uphold in this conversation as like the woke position that actually I'm like, we're morally inconsistent on all over the place. Right. So people are like, oh, we shouldn't have any tracking. Tracking is bad. Research says tracking is bad. You know, clearly it's bad. And I'm like, mm, I'm calling suspect on all of that. Almost everything we do in life, <laughs> man, well, I shouldn't say almost everything, many, many, many things we do with kids, particularly because they're on, you know, more uh, developmental spectrum, right, um, of rapid development as opposed to adults, um, is tracked in some form or another, right? When kids play sports, when they're young, they play by age group. When they reach adolescence, they play by, you know, freshman, JV, varsity, right? Which is sort of by age group, but then starts to shift into just purely developmental level, right? So you have some like 10th graders who play varsity, some 10th graders who play JV, right? The same kind of thing happens in band, right? Different music programs, same thing happens in dance, same thing happens in all kinds, you know, debate leagues, all kinds of, um, you know, competitive, artistic, athletic performance um, kinds of spaces. And to my knowledge, there's nobody out there crying, um, you know, foul about those sorts of systems, right? So folks, you know, folks tend to think of the fact that there's JV and there's varsity as actually a good thing because developmentally kids can play with other kids who are kind of at their, you know, at their level, right? Um, and we don't see that as an oppressive system. We see that as like, of course you would do it this way, right? We have, you know, academically AP programs and IB programs, right? And of course, those conversations are laden with the same, you know, complicated racial uh, dynamics at play um, because our society's longstanding history of oppression <laughs> happens to, you know, particularly push upon um, the levers of access and opportunity when it comes to, to getting into those those uh, classroom environments, right? But I think we have an unresolved question there around like, is it actually, we want to say that the like woke progressive position is that there shouldn't be this kind of tracking. Yet we don't practice that in most other aspects of our life. And there's just something uh, like kind of intuitive about it that doesn't seem to hold up to scrutiny um, in my mind. OK, I also and I know, you know, you mentioned like we often personalize these things rather than thinking about at scale, you know, what is actually the best policy? Yes, that's true. And I'm humble enough to say, like, look, you know, I know my experience is just my experience. And anecdotally, what I've seen, you know, as an educator isn't, you know, isn't truth writ large. But I also know, Manuel, for myself, I went to a regular kindergarten program. I had a horrible time. I had a teacher who tried to get me, you know, put into special ed and told me I was, you know, terrible. Um, and I got into all kinds of trouble. And going to a gifted program is literally like what saved me educationally, 
because I could already read. I was bored. I didn't, I was hyper. I didn't want to sit around and take a nap in the middle of the day. I was ready to run around and read stuff and, you know, play with things. Right. And if I had not been able to move into an environment that was more challenging for me, where I was, you know, engaged, I would have been in serious trouble academically, Manuel, and my entire life trajectory may have been may have been off. Now, maybe I'm just totally unrepresentative of, you know, of most people's experience, but that doesn't mean that my experience has no validity right um, in this in this kind of equation. And so for me, it's it's I feel very conflicted because this, even talking about this, the slippery slope between a rational discussion about this and like eugenics talk is super steep and super like oiled with history and <laughs> and white supremacy. Right. Um, so it's it's hard to even bring up because you go from being a rational person to being like nutty Tucker Carlson kind of person so quickly. Um, that said, I think we have to have this conversation, man, because I don't think the answer is let the status quo continue and just let wealthier, privileged people hoard all the, you know, quote unquote, gifted seats. I also don't think the answer is, um, you know, let's just have total heterogeneity in classrooms because one of the most difficult things for educators to do is differentiate and actually challenge all of their students. And for sure, what's going to happen is the students who need, who have greater needs, right? The lower performing students or the mid-range students are going to get more attention from teachers or uh, yes, from teachers than are students who are, you know, quote unquote, doing just fine, right? And don't need that kind of attention and support from the teacher. So I think there's an unresolved issue here. I think it's just so hard to talk about without being like a despicable racist, uh, you know, um, and that makes it, you know, really challenging. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I wonder about for your personal experience and you uh, being put in a setting that was much more uh, conducive to your learning and your growth and your development. Uh, I wonder how much of that is around issues around Gates and how much of it is around issues of the educators that were that you that you had. Like, did you get placed into a placement where educators were more skilled and more open to uh, your particular characteristics of how you you know navigate in a classroom? Because there's plenty of students, I think, out there who um, similarly, their education was disrupted in a negative way because they didn't get around uh, to be around educators who are more skilled and more uh, looked at them through a more humanizing lens. And that might have had nothing to do with gate. That might have had to do with this idea of how you're supposed to behave in the classroom. And so many students out there who don't conform to that get booted out. In your case, it worked out because you ended up in a gifted program. Um, what if it wasn't a gifted program, but it was just a, a school or a system or a place where the teachers were more... Uh, prepared and more supported in um, having students like you who were bouncing around. I don't know. I just, I, I hear what you're saying about the, how we track in all these other different ways. And I, I'm, that totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. I just feel like the way we track when it comes around, comes to gifted and talented, it's so muddled, so muddled with class and race, Definitely. so much so, which, Definitely. you know, clearly you're, you, you know, you agree with that. It's, it's just so muddled that I just wonder if we're doing more more harm than good when it comes to the other students. I just wonder if these resources and the conversations could be more around like supporting, building schools and supporting schools in a school system that um, that lets students flourish in their natural natural selves and doesn't force students to conform into one thing. And and those I think in gate like for myself, like I was a I conformed really well as a student, super quiet, always paid attention, always read, always did my homework, always did all those things. I don't think that I am like more academically capable than my classmates. I think I played the game better. Like I was w more suited to that, to what the, the the game wanted from you. So I, I don't know. I just I just feel like there's it's so muddled that I'm not against dismantling any pieces of it. I'm not against it because the, what we currently have certainly isn't working for so many students out there. But yeah, you're right. Giant conversation and that slippery slope yeah. towards like eugenics talk and like natural giftedness and all that stuff. Man, you said it was oiled with, yeah, I think oiled with our history and all that stuff. Yeah, that's some of the slickest, slickest oil that yes. exists is right there when it comes to like capacity and uh, uh, academic capacity and all that. But yeah. Jeff, man, this do now is run, it's run a little bit long. I don't know if you have anything <laughs> else that you want to say on that gifted part because, you know, we're about to get to some good ethnic studies conversation and we're going to really d dive deeper into what uh, a humanizing education and, and uh, supporting students, uh, critical consciousness 
might look like. But uh, you know, I'll pass it back to you because I just said a lot, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything about what I just uh, brought up. Yeah, quick, quickly in closing, I'll just say, man, well, I have a hunch that perhaps the right place for us to focus in this conversation is actually on the notion of giftedness as like a diagnosis uh, in general, because it is it is just like straight pseudoscience, right? Like it, right. <laughs> it is just we make up racist white supremacist tests and we give it to kids and lo and behold, the students who are in closest proximity to the, to the racial identity of the people who make the test do the best on the test, right? Um, and so, and then we label people as like, you are gifted as though that applies to every aspect of life, okay? And yeah. I've been in a lot of those gifted places and there's gifted kids in elementary school and gifted kids in the Ivy League who could barely tie their shoes, right? So, so like there's the, the idea that giftedness is some kind of holistic designation, um, I think is just like observably false. Yeah. Um, so that might be kind of the real place to like first talk about dismantling and then to think about like, okay, from there, what do we do to better target challenging educational supports to kids where they need them, right? Um, which might take us in a different direction than like, how do we allow more kids of color into the special gifted places? So um, more to come on that. And the fact that we talked so long about this, man, well, might be an indication that we need to expand this conversation in a future episode, maybe bring on an expert in this area and kind of dig into the, you know, more of the meat of it. So good stuff. I'm glad we got to talk about it, but definitely time now to move on to today's seminar. We are so excited to have Roxana Duenas coming back on um, to join us to talk more about ethnic studies. So stay tuned. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff, man, why, why are you buying my style, man? You got the same shirt I, I have on. Yeah, your style. I, I been had this shirt, man. Like I told you, I was wearing the blue shirt today. Dude, you got a lot of blue shirts. You wear a blue shirt down here every day. You didn't say you were gonna wear a Teach the Truth shirt. I'm wearing my Teach the Truth shirt. Why are you trying to be like me, man? Hey, listen, man, I went to aotashow.com slash support, right? Went to that merch store, got all the good, all the above show gear, all of it, right there, one button, no problem. aotashow.com slash support. Well, damn, that's the same place I went to get mine. So yeah, that's coincidence, coincidence. <laughs> aotashow.com slash support. Hit the button, get some dope AOTA show merchandise. Yeah, yeah man. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. We are so excited to have you here with us today. And we have an incredible guest with us. As we mentioned earlier, this is really a momentous day um, in the history of all the above because one of our very first guests from way back in our second episode four years ago um, is back today to join us again and to talk a little bit more about the fascinating issues around ethnic studies. So welcome back, Roxana Duenas. It's good to be back. Thank you for having me. All right, so let me tell you a little bit more about Roxana. Uh, Roxana Duenas is a history and ethnic studies teacher at the Math, Science, and Technology Magnet Academy at Roosevelt High School in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles. Roxana is widely respected for her work in co-creating and teaching ethnic studies courses, exploring issues of race, identity, and social justice. She has been a co-creator of the ethnic studies course Boyle Heights and Me with her colleagues Jorge Lopez and Eduardo Lopez, which explores the community's rich history of political organizing and student activism and has been teaching ethnic studies and history for 14 years now. She was recognized in 2015 as one of the United Way's 25 inspirational teachers and received the 2019 Community Service Award from the UCLA Alumni Association. Roxana has served on the Ethnic Studies Leadership Team for Los Angeles Unified School District, where Ethnic Studies will now be a graduation requirement starting in the 23-24 school year. And many of you may be thinking, hmm, that person looks familiar. Well, that's because Roxana was literally the face of the 2019 LA teacher strike captured in an iconic poster by artist Ernesto Yerena Montejano. Roxana is a graduate of UC Santa Barbara and UCLA, 
Welcome back, uh, Roxana, to All the Above. I'm going to kick it over to Manuel for our first question. Yeah, Ethics Studies, Dopeness in the Building. Thank you, Roxana, for coming by All the Above again. And it's been quite some time. It's been quite some time for those of us or for those uh, folks out there that might be watching this video or listening to the podcast version. Uh, we'll link Roxana's original appearance down below back in our, our second episode way back when. And um, Roxana, a lot has changed since then, especially in the realm of, of ethnic studies. So so since that first appearance, um, your district, Los Angeles Unified School District, has now adopted ethnic studies as a graduation requirement and now has ethnic studies um, being available at, at more and more schools. I think all schools, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And the state of California has very recently adopted ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. So by 2025, every school across California, every high school across California has to at least offer ethnic studies. And by 2029, every student who graduates from a school in California needs to have taken at least a semester of ethnic studies. And of course, we have a, a ethnic studies model curriculum across the state. And that was a long uh, politically fraught process. And here we are now, ethnic studies building across California. So we first want to start with your thoughts as somebody who's been an ethnic studies teacher for a very long time and a leader in ethnic studies discussions and development uh, for all these years. What are your thoughts about the, the, the move and the shift in policy around ethnic studies and what it might mean for our, our students and our communities? Yeah, I, you know, I've been really lucky. I always tell people I've been at two school sites, both at main campus Roosevelt and MSTMA where like we've been allowed to teach ethnic studies to all of our ninth graders um, for almost the last seven years now, that sometimes I forget that there's other spaces where it hasn't been as widely accessible. So I've been really focusing on just kind of, go, you know, growing and I think in, and building and strengthening our curriculum. Uh, but as it becomes a, a requirement, one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about, one, there's so many folks that are doing this amazing work and I get to learn from so many people that have been doing this even before it was even called ethnic studies, right? Um, just like social justice curriculum in general. But one of the questions I'm really thinking about is um, how are our teacher education programs gonna respond to this requirement? Because I think a lot is, you know, LAU, like LAUSD can provide um, professional development, but I guess it's more of a question that I, I'm really thinking about is, um, I think about UCLA, they have like an ethnic studies cohort where students get to get their credential and their masters and then they get to take extra coursework um, to get like an eth ethnic studies like certification that like they can teach the class, I guess. Um, and it gives them like additional support. I think they take like methods classes. Um, sometimes we have those student teachers that get to like sit in and observe our ethnic studies classes. But I'm just really wondering like system-wide, like how are we gonna support this um, beyond the school district and how are teacher education programs gonna respond to this so that folks are leaving credential programs um, able to teach this regardless of, of what their specific subject matter is because yeah, I, I think there's gonna be a, a big demand because I think even now folks who are teaching it are always looking for ideas. Like, how do I teach this? How do I implement this well? And so we're always building off of each other. I know that even what I'm doing, I'm always trying to find ways to, to improve it, to you know evolve and grow with what we're learning. Um, so there's gonna be, I think, a huge demand for that. And I'm just more wondering, how are we gonna meet that demand to mm. prepare folks one, who are really excited about teaching this, um, and two, folks who are a little bit hesitant, who are like, I don't really know what that is, but I might be able to teach it. Um, so I, I have more questions than, than anything. Yeah, that's uh, so interesting you bring that up, Roxana, because I've even heard some folks uh, ask similar questions about not only the folks who may be interested but need preparation or who are kind of on the fence, but like, what about contexts where you might have educators who are kind of hostile to the philosophy and ideas of ethnic studies, but are tasked with teaching it? What's the kind of check that might be in place so that, you know, there, there's not like some potentially really harmful teaching of ethnic studies that, um, you know, that could be could be offered to students. Um, so some so definitely some interesting uh, implications system wide for us to um, to think about. Um, and you as a person who, you know, who has a tremendous amount of experience teaching, uh, teaching ethnic studies are now doing so in this context where, you know, 
the the sort of lid has blown off of the discussion about this with the kind of boogeyman of of critical race theory or or CRT and the real kind of right wing mobilization around opposing teaching about race, teaching about social justice, teaching about kind of an honest telling of of American history. Um, to the point that you know the even the ethnic studies model curriculum in the state. Um, was really stripped back in many ways um, for some of its more critical uh, components that, that were initially going to be in the curriculum. So I'm wondering if you can share uh, with our audience, you know, as someone with expertise and experience, what advice might you offer to folks who are preparing to teach ethnic studies perhaps for the first time or who are really thinking about you know, how to hone and craft their practice to take on this important work? I think the very first thing is um, getting to know the students that you're, and, and we say that all the time, like you have to get to know your students, but I think to teach an, an ethnic studies class or with, with elements of like critical race theory or any analysis um, is like, even me, like every year it's so different because my students have just, they come in with different knowledges or different identities. Um, and so one really getting to know the students so that you're crafting a class, like no class will ever be the same as much as I want to keep my same syllabus. One, it's just not going to happen. Um, you have to get to know the needs of the students. Um, some of our students come with like a deep critical analysis that even if you're not providing it for them, they're going to question you and they're going to be questioning everything around them and the sources that you're giving them and the questions that you're asking. So um, sometimes you have students like that, right? Um, and sometimes you, you kind of really have to nudge the students to to start, you know, questioning, I, I think, um, whatever it is that you, you're discussing in class. So that's one aspect, um, getting to really know your students. Um, and I guess building with people who are doing similar work. I think when, I, when I'm doing my work, I can do my work because there's other folks that I know. Like if I teach this part, I know that in their 10th grade class or in another English class or by 12th grade, someone will be doing, you know, this, that, or whatever. Um, so one, the other thing too is taking the pressure off that they're going to learn everything that they need to learn about ethnic studies in one ninth grade like class. Like that's just not like possible. Um, so just kind of, I've been kind of zooming in a little bit more um, and making it inquiry based. When you talk about identity with students, when you give them a space and opportunity to reflect on themselves um, and you're asking questions, I think even if you're not talking about critical race theory, students will come to those conclusions or they're, or they're gonna have those questions or they're gonna do their own research. Our students are super, like, now that we're coming back to in-person, they're super tech savvy. Like they spent the last year and a half on their devices and their computers. Like you mentioned one thing and you have a student on a computer who's already like, well, this is what I found. And this is, these are the sources and like having conversations about what they're you know, looking for. Um, but I guess leaning on that curiosity of our students, they're super curious, like how do we leverage that in our ethnic studies class so that we don't have to spoon feed them everything. Um, but I think ask the right questions, create a, a space to facilitate uncomfortable conversations without getting hostile and defensive and remembering that our students are like 13, 14 years old, 15. Um, and sometimes just like we spent time in echo chambers, so did they. And so like, mm -hmm. How do we kind of like make sense of that um, without shaming our students when they're coming in with certain like ideas where you're like, ah, where did you get that information from? And whatever it is. Um, so yeah, there's like, I guess a lot of advice is, um, but uh, to know your students, inquiry-based collaboration um, and removing the pressure that they're going to leave your class note, like having covered, every tenet of critical race theory or, or whatever it may be. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking off the top of my head. Yeah. I, I am wondering, you know, I think that there's a lot of sage uh, wisdom in, in what you shared there. I am wondering if in this, you know, very uh, contentious political climate around ethnic studies has the, you know, the videos we see online of people going crazy about, you know, CRT at school board meetings and that kind of stuff. Has any of that, uh, sort of political context made its way into your classroom or your school in any way that that has impacted you um, this year? Um, 
I don't, I maybe not like I'm thinking about like in the classroom, maybe sometimes like, I think more about the, the comments that I hear from students every now and then um, where they're kind of repeating some, like, I think some of those ideas that are like anti-ethnic studies, like, why are we talking about this? Or like, you know, that's not racism and, you know, um, that is, but when I think more about my own practice and how it, it just changed, even within the, the pandemic, when we were teaching virtually, um, some of the conversations that I maybe was more hesitant about having, um, because we were like in a Zoom space and like, you have an audience, you have parents, siblings. Um, and I think when I'm in the classroom, students are more comfortable questioning and asking, uh, you know, disagreeing uh, with some of their like traditionally held beliefs. But I imagine that that would be really hard to do um, when you're at home and maybe there's like a, there's a conflict around those values or the, those beliefs. Um, and sometimes the classroom can be a safe space to question, to disagree. Um, and so I was more mindful about how I presented my curriculum. I think when we were teaching virtually. Um, so that's one thing that kind of comes to mind. Um, but in my classroom space um, or just on my campus, um, it, I don't think that I've, I've had to worry about that as much. It's just more like individual conversations with students who, um, yeah, they're like, you know, why, why are we taking this class or um, racism doesn't exist or, you know, things like that. Um, and those are more like individual, I think, instances. Um, and I kind of just take them as they go, like asking questions um, more than, or like not even necessarily trying to defend it. Cause I'm like, sometimes that's really hard to do. So it's like the work will eventually speak for itself. Like you, they're going to be in the classroom. They're, see, they're going to see what it's about. So I don't feel like compelled. Like I'm like, oh, I, I really appreciate that question. And, you know, as the lesson goes on, they, they may change their mind. They may not. Um, but I always am thinking the work will eventually speak for itself, whether yeah. what, if, what it's being accused of, I guess. Yeah. I don't know if that answered the question, but I think I'm in, I, I keep going back to like the privileged space where I get to be where, um, everyone is kind of doing this work on our, not everyone, a lot of people are doing this work. So I don't, I feel like I get to learn from other people more than having to like defend what we're doing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. And I think that, yeah, I think about my own school site, we don't have a rich history of ethnic studies offerings. Ethnic studies is brand new to my district this year. Um, but the, the, overwhelming majority of students, families, uh, school board members are uh, overwhelming majority are very much in support of ethnic studies. So I feel privileged in the sense of like not having to worry about fielding as many complaints or, or you know, my name coming up in a school board meeting and there being a ton of, of parents there crying critical race theory and all of this. But, you know, we know other parts of California are different. And, you know, the it, on, the, on the one hand, it's very good news that ethnic studies is growing across California and that it will one day be a graduation requirement. That, that's great, phenomenal in the sense of helping more and more students learn about these rich histories and, and see themselves as part of the, the ongoing struggle for, for justice for all. And that's wonderful. But then on the other hand, you know, the, the devil's in the details and there certainly will be certain districts or certain schools or certain teachers that are antagonistic towards it. And this, you know, the, the, the teaching requirement to like, okay, your period four is your ethnic studies class that might land in the lap of somebody, a teacher who's like very much against the, even just the notion of talking about race or anything like that. So, you know, a lot of folks are, are worried about what's going to happen in, as ethnic studies grows and as uh, more folks interact with it, who maybe are hostile or antagonistic towards it. So, um, maybe somebody's watching this or listening to this either now or her years from now, and they're trying to bring it into their district because the requirements coming down and they want to know, you know, what can we do or what should we do to help teachers responsibly teach and engage with ethnic studies? So what are your thoughts in, in terms of trying to build up the capacity of folks in, in other districts and other regions to to do right by ethnic studies? What are, what are some things that you think maybe the, the state or district should uh, try to do or should look into in order to help prepare teachers, uh, the next generation of teachers really, um, to do right by ethnic studies? I think first and foremost, like investing, like financially, like if you want to are highly trained in critical ethnic studies, I always say the same way that you teach in like, uh, or the same way that you invest in like math interventions and reading interventions. If you want your students to be racially literate, 
the same way that you pull up data on like math and like where students are proficient or they're below the same way that that data is being pulled out. And we have meetings where like, hey, students are not performing in the reading level or in the math level. Um, and then we invest tons of money in like tutoring and coaches and professional development and conferences and books and all of that stuff that like is, again, to help benefit our students where, where they're struggling. Um, if we really are honest or really authentic about wanting our students to be racially uh, literate to, to, or to be able to read the world and to really navigate and for teachers to be able to teach it the same way that I'm being trained, you know, in, in those aspects of like reading and writing and the other, you, you know, subjects, we need to be investing financially um, to, to train teachers to do that. Because I think across the state and across the country, there's teachers that have been doing this work and they've been doing it before. Again, it was called ethnic studies. They've been, you know, creating this powerful curriculum that empowers students where they're like analyzing race, class, gender, they're learning about their community and activism and agency. Like it's been happening right and now. We're just giving it these like really specific titles, leaning into the community um, and the people that who've, who've done this work and then compensating them for their work. Because this is often one of those things where it's like, we really value it, but can you do this free workshop? Or can you do this, like, can you go to this PD during your free time? And it's like, we do it because we love it and we're really passionate about it. And we know that the stakes are high. Like we really want our students to leave feeling like they can navigate the world and deconstruct these, you know, oppressive structures. But I'm like, we can't do this for free forever because it's just not sustainable and people burn out and then they leave the profession because it's, already hard as it is. So if districts are really honest or really genuine about this, like you have to invest financially. And I feel like that's probably gonna be one of the hard things, but there are teachers and people in the community um, and outside of the classroom who, who can teach us more about this to, and to grow in this practice. Um, but I don't think they should be expected to do it, to do it for free. The same way we won't, wouldn't be expected to do it for like a math literacy or math intervention or reading intervention, whatever that may be. Um, invest in, in those same, like they're just as important, right? Like, so that's, I hope that that's what happens. Um, I, I don't know how that'll turn out though. I don't know. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that because in thinking about the different instructional coaches that we have and in different um, programs that different districts have. Yeah, I, I personally have not really considered the fact that, yes, they need that for ethnic studies. Like why why not have a coach, an instructional coach or uh, somebody from the district that supports different schools in their development of teachers own racial literacies and their capacity to help students along with that that curriculum. I I, I hope somebody listen, listening to this or watching this is, is gonna hear your words there and your suggestions right there and build on that because uh, absolutely, absolutely. Rather than just throw the ethnic studies course on the lap of a teacher that doesn't know anything about it and just whatever, do your best. No, nah, let's really invest in this and, and get it right and make sure it's right for, for our students and really build on this and compensate folks because there's such a, a wealthy community community of folks who have done this work for decades and compensate them right and help them out so that we could get this across more schools. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love that idea as well. And you're, you're making me think a lot, Roxana, about um, a, a guest we had on a couple of months ago, uh, Professor Yolanda Seely Ruiz uh, from Teachers College who specializes in, in many things, but one of them is racial literacy and you know, training teachers about teaching about racial literacy. And um, you know, this, this idea that like, how do we define success, right? It's clear we define success by kids being able to like read on grade level and you know, do math at certain levels of sophistication throughout their educational career. But what if we also define success <laughs> as developing racial literacy, right? Um, and being able to navigate this really important aspect of our world with, you know, skill and, and sophistication, right? Um, and so what a, what a beautiful idea in terms of how we might shift our definition of, of what success looks like um, as a result of our, you know, 13 years of, of public education. So, um, Rixana, something you are, um, making me think a bit about here is the the role of teaching ethnic studies across difference. And um, 
you know, uh, in even in your context where I know like the the system, the quote unquote system um, might look at your school and say like it's very homogenous um, in terms of the, the racial population. Um, we know that even within that uh, homogeneity, there's lots of diversity, right? There's different experiences in terms of um, immigration and migration. There's different experiences in terms of language and culture and, um, you know, national origin, all kinds of stuff um, that I'm sure you you have to grapple with uh, in many ways. And i um, wondering if you can maybe share a little bit about that in terms of your work of, of kind of teaching, teaching ethnic studies across difference and also maybe share some wisdom with, um, with folks who are working in situations where, um, you know, that they may be teaching across really, really broad um, types of, of racial difference or other aspects of identity teaching across difference um, with their students and kind of what that's like for you, what you would offer folks who are engaging in this maybe um, for the first time or with, with less experience? Yeah, so I think about, yeah, our students, it's like uh, our school is like 99% Latino, um, like Mexican, Mexican-American. And there's like a little bit of variety within that, but yeah, it's, it's pretty homogenous. Uh, but even still, that can be really misleading because like everybody comes, even me, like I'm from the community, right? Like I grew up in East LA. And so I might sometimes make the assumption, oh, like they have the same experiences. And, and it's just, one, there's a huge age difference now. Uh, but then there's just this, so much, there's so much nuance and variety, right? So I think the way that we have sequenced our class for the, the ninth grade ethnic studies class that we teach. And I think other folks do it pretty similarly, but um, one, like starting the class, the, the first unit that we do, one of the first ones is identity. One, to, to have the students self-reflect, like who am I at this particular moment in time? But in their self-reflection, you're, you're just learning so much from the students about wh where their parents come from, what's important to them, what are their values, what are their goals, um, what are the harms and traumas that they've experienced, right, through, you know, when we think about the isms. Um, so one, there's that first aspect of like identity, just like student-centered, like your stories, no matter how ordinary and mundane or extraordinary, um, they are that that that's going to be the center of the class, right? So, like, regardless of where you're teaching, I think that's like central. Um, and again, facilitating a space where students start to feel comfortable even talking about that, because some students feel really comfortable talking about their identities and lived experiences, and for some, that that's just like a like because they're not used to it, right? Like at school, we center everybody else's story and everybody else's experience, and then we suddenly ask students like, "Tell me about you," and they're like, "I had a student who was like, nobody's ever asked me like." this and so like I don't even know what to say and I'm just like oh, I didn't think about that so like even the space to practice self-reflection and just reinforcing like when we come from like minoritized and marginalized right like how do we develop that or like build that confidence that like your story matters your your and students are like well you know I haven't really done anything I'm 13 that story matters like your parents stories like your grandparents your community like Matters. And I just want to hear it because I'm really excited to get to know who you are in this moment in time. And that can be really uncomfortable for teenagers. are like, why? Why do you care? And it's like, because I do. Right. And then we take those stories and then we start adding these like um, theoretical frameworks. The students learn about community cultural walk by Dr. Tarayoso to identify what are their personal strengths, familial capital, linguistic capital, aspirational, resistance capital. Right. And then we start adding other layers of um, understanding the world through like the four eyes of oppression right and so you're just giving them these lenses like and so people always ask me like what, what are your kids reading and I'm like well, we're not reading one single thing because I'm just more giving them we're offering them lenses to examine themselves in the world and you kind of don't know what you're going to get right like you some some of our students have like an immense amount of privilege and so they might kind of get uncomfortable and it's like just letting even exploring power privilege, what do the four eyes of oppression mean? How do we empower each other? How do we develop um, solidarity? So for me, it's more about lenses and spaces for students to just even make sense of that and kind of mess up. Like I always tell the students, like, it's okay to get it wrong. Like if you knew everything in the history of ever, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't need schools. Like just say it. And if it's confusing or you have a question, like we'll figure it out. Um, obviously, as long as it's not coming from a place of like trying to harm somebody else in the classroom. Um, 
but the more I do this work, you know, I think when I first started ethnic studies, I was like, oh, I really need to teach this really specific content. They really need to know about the walkouts. They need to know about these really specific events, which are important. But I'm more thinking now is like, um, how do we create space for students to really reflect on their, you know, their identities, intersectionality? Um, when are you, you know, engaging in oppressive, you know, practices, or when are you experiencing it? And what have people done in history or in our families or in our communities to navigate that? And so I think for everyone, it's going to be absolutely different because I live in, you know, East LA in Boyle Heights. I always lean on like the walkouts. That's the thing that like, I could probably skip everything else, but I'm always going to talk about the walkouts because to me, I, I want students to know that one, the school that they attend is like part of this rich legacy of resistance. And that the reason that we exist is because of something that a bunch of 15 year olds did 50 years ago. I'm like, we get to sit here and talk about race, class, and gender. And I don't have to do my job because people your age 50 years ago decided that they were going to organize these events. And so, so if they did it and we're here reaping the benefits of that, what else can we do? And some students are like, what? Like the walkouts? And we never heard of it. And I'm like, you've heard of like every other historical event, but not the walkouts. So I've taken a step back from content and really centering spaces for students to reflect on themselves. And then little by little introducing theoretical frameworks or lenses for eyes of oppression, community cultural wealth, um, so that they can then go and explore on their own more than me trying to focus on one single, I think, piece of content or something. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I guess ethnic studies is really student centered. And it's not about like trying to shame our kids because it's like we're products of society, but it's like, can we question these things? Mm -hmm. And so it's more about that than anything else. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's probably going to be an ongoing challenge as well, right? Because the education system, it, it's... It doesn't really like the whole idea of student-centered and open and flexible and depends on the community, depends on who your students are in front of you. The education system is very much, this is the packaged curriculum. This is, these are the assessments. This is the pacing guide, and this is what you need to do. So I think as, as ethnic studies grows, at least across California and, and district leaders and teachers reach for their like, well, where's the curriculum? Hand me the curriculum, send it to me, share it with me on Google Drive, or where's the textbook? What's the te and they want that, but as you just laid out, it's, it's inquiry-based and student-centered in like a real way. You know, th those terms get thrown around in education a lot, like student-centered and, but like in a very real authentic way, that's what ethnic studies is. And that's very uncomfortable for a lot of folks who, you know, subscribe to the more like colonial view of education and the factory model of like, sit there, learn this, show me on the test and let's move on. So yeah, thank you for emphasizing that throughout this conversation, the the need for ethnic studies to really be um, focused on the students that you have in front of you. And and um, and yeah, so one last thing before, before uh, we finish this discussion and we can't, we can't finish this discussion without talking about the, the LA strike, the, uh, the teacher strike and your face being like literally the face of the strike. And we, uh, last time you we were on this show, you know, it seems like a, a, a eon ago, but you know, since then, like, I think the, the, the bit of star power that we have right here is is elevated because so many folks recognize you from that strike, but not not just that, but obviously you being uh, the leader that you are in education. And we we had a conversation a few months ago with uh, Dr. Christina Villarreal, Dr. V from a uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, and she brought you up and, and your name pops up a lot. Like, you know, so we want to just ask, what was the the experience like being the face of the strike, but also just the fact that, you know, you, a lot of folks are coming to learn and find out about just how, how dope you are as educator. Sorry, I just got to say it. Like a lot of folks are coming to learn about your dopeness. So what, what, what has that experience been like? Um, it was actually, it was hard. I will say that. I think, um, you know, Ernesto, when he, he reached out to me about the project, I always tell folks like, he really downplayed it. He's like, oh, I have this little thing I have to do for UTLA. Like, can I just take your picture? It's going to be for, you know, some stuff that, that we might be, this was in November and we were thinking about going on strike. Like maybe like it might happen like in December, maybe, but I was like, there's no way we're going to actually like the largest, one of the largest districts in the country. You know, it, was, it, it was not in my realm of like that, that would even happen. So I was like, yeah, sure. I, I tell people like I was on my way to the gym. I still went to the gym. I showed up to his like studio, like just real, like 
whatever, like not, I didn't even do my, whatever. I was just not thinking much of it. I was like, let's just take my picture. Um, and then eventually as things started to unfold, I was like, what do you mean? Like, the, like I thought it was going to be a bulletin for UTL. Like it was going to be like a mailer. Just, yeah. that's it. Like, Hey, you know, this is what is happening. Um, and it is, as it started to unfold, I was like, whoa, this is like nuts. Like, this is not what I was. And then when we actually went on strike and they started to print thousands of posters, I was like, what, like, what is, like, we're going on strike. That's my face. Like, all, like it was shocking. And then I got to a place where I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then it got to like, this is uncomfortable. I'm not mm -hmm. used to this kind of attention. What are people going to think? Um, I, I immediately went into like my imposter syndrome of like, um, I know so many teachers that are so much cooler, that are so much, you know, I, I just really got in my head and it, like, I think I, it was hard. Like, I just felt like, oh my God, people must be judging me. Like, because they're like, why her? And so it was really hard, I think at first. Mm -hmm. Um, and then people, you know, like the media was reaching out and I was like, what if I say the wrong thing? And I misrepresent like thousands of teachers. And so I definitely felt the pressure. Um, and I think I, I kind of closed in a little bit. Um, and then with time, um, I think once the strike was over, um, and we went back into the classroom and I think with just more time, I was able to step back and be like, that was actually really cool. Um, and I think as teachers, you know, we're in our little bubble and like you kind of just doing your thing, not really aware of what's happening any, you know, anywhere else. And it's like a very like, it could be like a, not a quiet experience, but you're just in your little bubble. Um, and when that happened and people were like, oh, that's really cool. I was like, this actually feels really nice to be acknowledged for our work. Like, but we're not used to it. We're actually, so, and that was really, it was really uncomfortable to have people compliment me on my work because you just, like the students aren't complimenting you after a dope lesson. They're not like, Hey, that was awesome. Like, they're just kind of like, oh, God. And then like maybe five years later, they're like, Oh yeah, I really liked your class. And you're like, really you did. And so you don't ever get the like instant gratification of like a dope lesson other than like them being really engaged. Um, so it just made me realize like how important it is to like uplift and like, you know, shine light on our teachers because I'm like, this is really hard work. And we don't, we don't ever get like any of it. Very rarely do we get the acknowledgement. And then when you finally do, it's uncomfortable because it feels so unfamiliar. At least it did for me. And it just made me realize every teacher should have a billboard and it's on the LA times. And like, everyone should be like, have this wonderful spotlight because after a while I was like, Oh, that actually did feel really nice. And I don't think you should be like a superstar, like teacher, like, like just teaching is just really hard in general and your face shouldn't have to be on a billboard to like get that acknowledgement. It's like, we need to really, that's one thing that I now, what, two or three years later, I'm like, our teachers deserve so much more. Like just, <laughs> so, so it's really nice. And I know I still want to go back to the idea that like, there's so many people doing such amazing work and it's like, we need to like be shining tons of spotlights across um, the district and the nation and not just in this uh, performative like teacher appreciation week here's a donut which I love but like we have to be doing more you know it says my connection is unstable but I don't know if you can hear me but yeah it, it was just a lot um and it was really hard at first but now I'm really really grateful um I feel like it forced me to acknowledge my own work and like give myself credit. And I don't think we do that enough as teachers. We're really, really hard on ourselves. Um, and so I have deep gratitude now for the experience. Like it's really transformed me, I think, as a teacher and just as a person. So whenever I see Ernesto, I'm like, dude, thanks a lot. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, Roxana, thanks so much for sharing for sharing that. I think um, you know it, it's it's been something I've been curious about for a while. Um, you know, it's, it's it's rare. I feel like when you see an image of a movement that's that big, and you're like, oh, I know who that person is. That's a real person, right? Um, so really appreciate you sharing a little bit of insight about about that experience, and of course, all of your thoughts today um, about ethnic studies. Um, you know, this is, uh, 
a really fascinating moment in education, uh, especially here in California, where we're seeing the advancement of one of the most, from my perspective at least, one of the most interesting uh, sets of curriculum that exists uh, in schools um, and expanding that in, as, as sort of a right for all kids to experience so that Hopefully we don't have the situation where kids have to wait until they get to college to learn, you know, critical aspects of, of history and identity and that sort of thing. So appreciate your, your words here today and your leadership on this front um, more generally. Um, so Roxana, join us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, that's it for today's seminar. But next up is our class dismissed. Stay tuned. All right, folks, we have come to that time in our episode that we call the class dismissed. It's our time where we like to give uh, some props, some celebrations, some flowers to folks doing great things in education. And today's class dismissed is actually kind of interesting because it maybe isn't traditionally what you would think of as folks doing great work in education, but folks doing great work in media who have had a profound impact on this show, uh, which of course is all about education. And uh, some of our viewers and listeners, especially those folks who are sports fans, you are familiar with ESPN's legendary show, Pardon the Interruption, also known as PTI, hosted by Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon. Um, and they just recently celebrated their 20 year anniversary as a television show. Um, so we wanted to give props and congratulations to them. And we want to tell you a little bit about what the heck that has to do with all the above. So Manuel's going to dig into it for us. Uh, Manuel, tell us about all the above and PTI. Yeah, for sure. So Jeff, one day we'll have to do, maybe maybe for a passing period, I don't know, we'll have to do a an episode where we really explore the roots of our show all of the above and sort of how it came to be because I think we have a lot of a lot of folks who've joined us over the course of these uh four or five years whatever it's been and um maybe missed the beginnings of it and uh, you know maybe maybe for our 100th episode or something like that but but yeah so when this show first first started so you know I was finishing my graduate program my um for my doctorate degree at UCLA and a lot of times after after getting a doctorate folks are like okay this is time to what publish some stuff or like explore like roles in academia or um, bigger roles at the district or whatever and I was very very intent on staying in the classroom I'm a dedicated high school history teacher I didn't want to leave the classroom for various reasons which I won't get into here um, but I did want to help like share and expand and explore some of these conversations that I had through my um, through my graduate uh, program and bring some of those conversations to, to everyday folks who are working in classrooms and working in schools and school systems. And I was, I've always been a big fan of Pardon the Interruption on ESPN. And I was watching it one day as I was like finishing up some like dissertation stuff. And I was thinking like, wouldn't it be cool to have a show kind of like that, but that, you know, takes a look at different education issues. So for those who aren't familiar with PTI or Pardon the Interruption, you know, it's a sports show, it's a half hour program, and it infamously brought in the concept of a visual rundown. So a lot of shows that you see across across the spectrum of television, they have like a, a graphic on the side that, that shows you what topics are coming up. And it's kind of like a rundown of the topic so that you know what's coming up. So that like if the topic you're into right now or, or they're talking about right now isn't of interest to you, like in a few minutes, they'll be on this next topic. And you you can't wait to hear what they say about that next topic. Well, PTI was the first show to do that. And they, they call it the rundown. And all of the above, of course, we have, we have our agenda, which is essentially our version of their rundown down and you know I was finishing up my dissertation I was watching the show and I was like look we need something like that so we can have these conversations around education and do it in such a way that it's um it's engaging for folks and no matter if you are a elementary classroom teacher or you're a district administrator or you're uh, a parent or something else you know let's have these conversations let's not just let these conversations sit in the world of academia or in the world of policy making let's let's open them up for everybody and you know that was my initial thinking around the show and Jeff I reached out to you because I was thinking like okay who knows a ton about education education and isn't like doesn't hesitate to like speak their mind and speak their truth and you know uh, I thought about you and we reached out and then you know the rest of his is history but we want to shout out part in the interruption for sort of laying the groundwork of this idea of discussing different topics in an accessible way granted our show runs long we don't you know they have a clock that ticks throughout the show to like <laughs> get on to the next topic um yeah we we kind of run long sometimes we don't really like get to the next topic quickly but 
the original idea about this show, like explore different topics in education and then take some time with the guest and like dig deep into a particular topic. Yeah, that, that came from part in the interruption. We're far from the only show who has been inspired by PTI. So we want to just give a, a, a big shout out to them for 20 years and to just the legacy that they've left in television and having these conversations around different topics and doing it in such a way that's accessible for folks, especially in this heavily like media driven click click type of environment. So shout out to them, man. Pardon the interruption. Yeah. 20 years, 20 years. Indeed. Happy 20th uh, to pardon the interruption. And I will I would just add, man, well, I also as a big, you know, sports fan love PTI. And um, I will say I know our audience. So we make this video version of the show. Uh, for our full episodes, but our bigger, you know, the largest share of our audience actually listens to the show as a podcast. Yeah. So some of you out there may not actually v be able to visualize what we're talking about because you usually just listen. So this would be your prompt to head on over right now yeah. to YouTube, just youtube.com slash all of the above, right? YouTube.com slash all the above, all, you know, all one word. Um, that is our channel. Subscribe. Take a look at what uh, what you might be, you know, missing there visually uh, to get a sense of the, of the connection. And one last thing, man. Well, I would say one of my favorite things about PTI when I used to, um, or when he used to be on the show back in the day, was uh, you know they had Stat Boy, they had uh, Tony Reale, yeah. who used to like keep track of you know where they <laughs> where Wilbon and Kornheiser made like mistakes. Um, and then, of course, Tony Reale got his own show on on Around the Horn. Um, so I don't think he he plays the role of uh, Stat Boy anymore. Um, maybe I'm mistaken about that. But um, but if you want to help all the above, <laughs> uh, we could use a Stat Boy um, on our <laughs> on our show or a Stat Girl, Stat Woman um, um, on our show as well. So if you want to support all the above. Here's what you can do. Go to our website, which is aotashow.com slash support. That's aotashow.com slash support. There you can find all the ways to support us. Um, you can subscribe on Anchor. You can donate um, via Venmo or Cash App. Every little bit helps us um, keep bringing this great content to you. So thanks to all of our supporters. Um, thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. And if you want to join uh, the community, please do so. Again, that's aotashow dot com slash support all right see you later knuckleheads we'll try to do better next time <laughs> love y'all <laughs>